Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. We are continuing our journey on the ASE test prep series and today we are discussing the dreaded A2 dreaded. ASE exam. A2, let's get started. All right, a transmission is leaking near the area where the drive shaft enters the transmission. Which of the components below is the most likely cause of this leak? A, oil pump seal, B, output shaft seal, C, manual linkage seal, and D, input shaft seal. Uh, so I'd say right off the bat, knowing your inputs versus your outputs sure. is probably gonna be a big help on this one. Um, and you don't need to know much about transmissions no. to really know that, right? The front of the transmission is your input, and the rear of the transmission is your output. And they did mention where the drive shaft enters the transmission. And if you've seen underneath a car, especially on a rear wheel drive vehicle that has a drive shaft, that drive shaft is coming right out the back, hence the output. Output. So yeah, this right. Is, this is a gimme question. There are plenty of these, and uh, that's why we're saying you don't need to be a transmission rebuilder to get all these right. I mean, uh, this is a very, very easy one. Now, there's one extra thing I would like to uh, to add to this is that uh, when we do have a leak in that area, especially on uh, what they're describing, uh, oftentimes people will change that uh, output shaft seal. Uh, the seal on the extension housing and it will and continue it to leak yeah. yeah so inside that housing is a bushing and uh, what i like to do when i see that leak is replace that bushing as well, well not as the just seal. replace it when you're under there just grab that drive oh, and shaft give it that, a... yep and go up and down if you see a lot of movement hey remove the extension housing and you could replace the bushing in the back right. and that's going to keep it from happening again I right mean, right it's very common we see that people will take the drive shaft put a new seal hey and it leaks same thing happens with the rear main right you have an engine that's all worn out you can replace that rear main but it, that leak's going to come back because the crankshaft's moving around so much so also the, sometimes we'll have a groove concept. in that crankshaft too and we'll that's have a lot of trouble too, there right, that seal yeah. will actually wear a groove in there so that could be an issue as well so best answer here and like i well, said just, this is a gimme i mean looking at them if because we're saying it's a gimme right but we haven't really covered each of these sure. wheel pumps at the front right so that x is a right sure. up right mm -hmm. um output shaft seal i think that's our best bet because that's Definitely. where the drive shaft's coming out manual linkage seal so that's going to be where your shifting area is going to be again not where the drive shaft is yeah. and then these are input shaft seal which is on the opposite end of the transmission so like yeah. daniel said you don't have to be a specialist to to know yeah. some of these there's no excuse on this one if you just take a minute take a breath read them you're gonna get this where right. are things as long as you kind of have an understanding of front and back then you got this you're gonna one. be okay so output shaft seal best answer we're going with b on that one the next question says technician a says that engine rpm should drop 600 rpm when the torque converter clutch engages technician b says that the torque converter should disengage when the brake pedal is depressed who is correct um i think that this is another one of those side notes. You need to know what the torque converter does, right? If you don't understand what a torque converter does, and that's gonna make this question a little hard to understand. Um, we know that the torque converter's job is to disengage uh, our transmission from our engine, right? So the engine continues to run at idle um, without the car trying to take off. Uh, in a manual transmission, you would just stall if you didn't take it out of gear, right? So the torque converter is going to allow that to, to disengage and engage. Um, now, with that being said, Tech A says that the engine RPM should drop 600 RPM when the torque converter clutch engages. So again, on that side note, a torque converter clutch. What does the torque converter clutch do? Right. What does that torque converter clutch do? Well, we'd have to have a better understanding of the torque converter itself. And the torque converter itself is a form of a fluid coupling. Right. But it's one better. It includes an extra element called a stator, right. which adds torque multiplication. So it is a fluid coupling with uh, torque multiplication. Additionally, on the later model vehicles, we added a clutch, which will add a way to directly connect the engine and transmission. So we get 100% transfer. That fluid coupling is always going to have some inefficiency. Meaning, right, it's not 100%. Right. If the engine's going to spin at 100 RPM, then you know your your transmission might be at I don't know 96 or something. You're going to have some loss there. And uh, down low, you have a lot of loss. It's quite inefficient. Like you brought up, you can come to a complete stop and hold the brakes and the engine does not stall. Right. Now, the issue with this question is it says there's going to be a 600 RPM drop when you lock it up. 
This would take away the inefficiency of the torque converter. Right. The problem with the question is that, is 600 reasonable? Now, the truth is, depending on the type of torque converter you have, maybe you're, you know, you got a, whatever, a Mustang that's souped up and you have a 4,000 stall converter. When you lock it up, it's going to drop significantly more well, than and a I stock think that's stall important converter. for everybody watching to take note of that because some of them might be watching or watching and thinking, why would the RPM drop at all? We're putting more load on the engine by engaging the transmission better with the engine, right? And if we're putting more load on the engine, that means it's gonna bog it down, right? So now with that being said, let's talk about the RPM drop, 600 RPM. Yeah, that's a lot. And I've never heard of anything anywhere near that. Generally, you're thinking 100 to 200 RPM. It feels like a shift a little bit and you could feel it in, in most of your cars, um, but it's not that dramatic. Now, if right. the converter is very loose, maybe it's some aftermarket deal. It could be, you know, 300 or more. It just depends on the converter. The other thing is in modern cars, we're locking and unlocking the converter all the time. Right. So it is very hard to feel. We also pulse with modulate it so we don't get this definite uh, change in RPM uh, instantly. So it's a little harder to feel than it used to be, but 600 is way too much. So right, right away we can say A is just, that's that's absurd. Yeah. If it said 200, I would consider it, but 600, that's, that's, so a, much. that's like shifting gears. Oh yeah. That makes zero sense. Right, right. So let's take a look. What is B saying? Tech B says that the torque converter should disengage when the brake pedal is depressed. Now we, again, the job of the torque converter is to disengage the engine from the transmission so we don't stall out the engine. So I'm going to agree with Tech B. Yeah, definitely. You do not want to allow that clutch to remain engaged right. uh, as you're slowing down. You want it to unlock. And a lot of transmissions will unlock the converter based on load and different factors like that. If you roll on the throttle, it will generally unlock. So there's a few ways of doing it. Uh, modern cars are very complex, but even the old cars, when we first started installing lockup converters, they would definitely unlock when we hit the brakes. They'd have right. a brake switch right away unlock uh, right. that converter. So best answer on this one, Sounds like tech B's our man. B only. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the next question. Next question says, technician A says that a faulty constant velocity joint or CV joint can cause a clicking noise when the vehicle is making a turn. Technician B says that a faulty wheel hub bearing can cause a metallic roar while making a turn. Who is correct? Mm. So let's go back to that tech A. I think we've all heard of the clicking CV joint, especially mm -hmm. when making a turn. Um, and it's my understanding that uh, generally the clicking comes from the opposite side of the the way you're turning, right? So you know that's have a good, you heard I've of that? I've never really thought I can. I've heard that, but I'm not quite sure like the mechanism. Yeah, I don't. What's going I on can't there. think off the top of my head, but it's really common. We'll go to a cul-de-sac. I'll turn the wheel all, all the, the way, way in one, one direction and accelerate. Put right. a little torque you're going to audibly hear which side it's from. So right. it's, it's quite easy. Right. Um, there's other axle concerns that are a little harder to diagnose, like uh, shutters and things like that. But the clicking is, it's very easy to hear. And this right. is why I like the AAC, because it's written like you're a technician. Right. Right. That question is like, you've been in the field, you're working on cars, and your diagnosed customer comes in and they're hearing this noise. So that's a very, very good question. And it does prove that you have some experience right. in the field. So right. yeah, definitely a, uh, a possibility, right? Now right. Tech B is talking about a wheel bearing and the type of noise that it may make. And also it's saying a metallic roar here, but they also bring up, well, uh, making a turn. So can you tell yeah. us why is making a turn going to change uh, this this noise? Well, what, it's an interesting point because uh, I mean wheel bearings make can make a metallic roar without you turning. That's a good point. Yeah. So, um, uh, but I'm gonna uh, whether you're turning or whether you're not turning, right. I'm gonna agree with Tech B just because a, a, yeah. a, a, a wheel bearing is gonna make a metallic roar. Um, now, while making a turn, maybe it can be more pronounced. I'm assuming because of load. Definitely. And right? this is what I use to diagnose at least the side uh, where the noise is coming from. Oh, that's a good from. point, yeah. So I'll go down a road. I'm not making a sharp turn like uh, Tech A looking for a CV joint. I'll go down a road and I'll get some speed and then swerve left and right. right. And when I swerve to the right, it's gonna cause a weight transfer to the left. Right. So if the wheel bearing noise is from the left, you're gonna hear a much uh, a louder- More uh, pronounced. Yes, now when you go the opposite side, it's gonna be less pronounced. Now, don't take it for granted front or rear. Then I would say isolate the side, 
take off the wheels, if you have to remove the axle, say it's front wheel drive or something. Right. To, and you might not have deflection. You got to be careful with that. Everyone's looking for deflection with wheel bearings. There's not always deflection. Right, right. And it's just, a, it's a quick and easy check it that is. I like if to do because is, if you're getting deflection, then you know for sure. 100%. Check but it first. But just because you don't have deflection doesn't mean that the wheel bearing Disassemble it. You're going to take the brakes apart. You're going to pull the axle out of its front wheel drive because you're not going to be able to feel anything. And then you're going to spin it by hand. You're going to know uh, if you're on the right bearing. I've seen it a million times where people say, oh, it's on the left side. It's got to be the front and it's the rear. It's very easy uh, for that to occur. So what are we going with uh, on this question? Uh, it sounds to me like both are viable options. I like it. Um, so best answer here is going to be C, C. Both technicians. Both of them. Both of them. Let's take a look at that next question. A transaxle is being diagnosed for a late shifting problem. Which of the following faults would most likely cause this problem? A. Broken throttle valve cable. B. Throttle valve linkage adjusted too tight. C. Loose band adjustment, and D, throttle valve linkage adjusted to loose. The other thing is, if we're going to look at these uh, these possible answers, one thing that jumps out uh, to me would be that we have uh, B saying uh, throttle valve linkage adjusted to tight, and D, throttle valve linkage adjusted to loose. And one thing we need to understand is when they're giving you uh, kind of the opposites there, generally it's going to be one or the other, right? So the other two be. answers, it can be. probably and, don't even need to look at. And we at. do have to think that three of the four answers have to do with a throttle valve problem. Mm -hmm, definitely. So that's another, I'd say, key take key takeaway. Right. And then taking a look at, oh, well, one is adjusted too tight and one is mm -hmm. adjusted too now the, loose. The difficulty with this question is going to be is, well, maybe you don't know what a throttle valve cable is. And right. the fact is, is if you haven't worked on uh, cars, you know, for the last 20 years, you, you might not no. Um, the last transmission that I can think of with a throttle valve cable, you know, from GM would be a 700 R4. For those who are familiar with that, I'm sure many people are. And uh, Ford had the AOD. The AOD also had a throttle valve cable. And you have to be very careful with those. If you worked on cars 20, 30 years ago, you would have remembered this. And um, it was a very, very important adjustment to make. Or perhaps if you forgot to hook the cable up, you would usually burn the transmission up right away. It was, it was a pretty embarrassing or pretty damaging thing to, uh, to forget. So what is that throttle valve for? Well, that throttle valve cable, as you're pulling it, so this is gonna be attached to the linkage on, let's say, a carburetor or the throttle body. And uh, as you're accelerating, you're gonna pull that cable and it's gonna increase the pressure in the transmission. Okay. So what would happen is, is if we left it disconnected, the pressure would never rise. Right. Right, so you're going to start accelerating. We're not going to get a buildup of pressure in the transmission, and of course, we're going to burn it up, right? But it also is going to have a huge effect on the shift points. But that's now, a good point right there, because then that tells you broken throttle valve cable, not the issue because it is shifting at all, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, well, that's that's definitely true. But you know, the fact is, is if we adjust it too tight, it's going to think you're giving more throttle than you actually are. Okay. And if you're giving more throttle, we're going to expect it to shift later. Right. Okay. And those old transmissions, like a 700 or 4, we had a governor pressure and we had this throttle valve pressure. And, you know, between the two, it's kind of controlling the shift points. Yeah. The governor was using a weights and springs, some centrifugal force to control the shift points. Okay. A lot of people back in the day would put a Corvette governor. Some people probably remember that. And it would, you know, your shift would go to like 6,000 RPM, something like that. Um, but... What we need to know is that's one, not a kick down cable. People used to screw that up all the time back in the day. They'd retrofit a 700 R4 in their, you know, old El Camino or Chevelle or whatever it was and think, oh, I don't know how to hook up this cable. I don't have the linkage. I don't have the yeah. brackets. I'll just leave it and go try to drive the car. That happened all the time. And of course, it always ended in disaster because the transmission would start slipping right away. So you would destroy the transmission very, very quickly. Now, back in the day, maybe we had a Turbo 350. Now, the Turbo 350 had a kick down cable. If you left it off, no biggie. That vehicle would not kick down properly, but you weren't going to burn it. That back right. vehicle used a modulator valve that would control those pressures, which was hooked to vacuum. So we're simulating, we're, we're trying to figure load out. The transmission's trying to understand load. You could do it with the cable or you could do it with vacuum. Right. right. In this case, we're using a cable and no vacuum on this type of transmission. So if we don't hook it up, we don't have it being pulled at all, well, we could assume what's going to happen there. We know if we pull it very tight, it's simulating full throttle where it's right. going to shift quite 
late, okay? And that's what this is saying. We have a late shifting problem. Right. Everything else there, if we go one by one, a broken cable, uh, well, you're not pulling at all. So it would right. be doing the opposite, okay? Right. Pressures won't be rising. It would be shifting very soon. Right, that would be if it was too loose, D, too right? Too loose, exactly. And uh, the other one we have as an option is option C, loose a band. loose band adjustment. Now, maybe you don't know what a band is. That's gonna be a problem. We're gonna at least have to have a basic understanding. Right, so make an asterisk right there. You do What's need to a band, be familiar right? with bands. Mm -hmm. Now, transmissions, automatic transmissions, sometimes use bands. A lot of the new ones don't, which is kind of a nice thing. But the band is gonna be there to basically stop an element, stop a drum. Okay, right. We're going to squeeze a drum and we're going to stop it and that's going to allow us to shift. So let's say we use a band for a second gear and the adjustment's too loose. Well, you're probably going to have an uh, effect on that shift or perhaps some slipping because it's not going to grab tight enough around right. that drum. So right. during that shift, you're going to have some issues there. Uh, but it's going to have nothing to do with shifting late. Right. right. So the best, best answer here, what are we going for? It sounds like we're going for a throttle valve linkage that's adjusted too tight, right? That's going to be our best answer, 100%. All the other ones are going to have nothing to do with shifting late. Now, like right. I said, the difficulty here is uh, throttle valve cables have not been around for a long time. Right. So. Okay, so a lot of people out there are going to be like, I don't even know what the hell that is. Right. And that's going to be the trouble there is understanding. Right. If you've been a dealer doing. tech for the last 20 years, you know you've not deal. seen a throttle cable. A and throttle you, and cable. you might not know what a band is either. That's the truth. Right. So yeah. Depending you, on what manufacturer exactly, you work for, that's Even true. if you're working on transmissions, right? So right. that's the, the difficulty there. If you're working on the modern stuff, uh, this might not apply. Unfortunately, as far as ASC is concerned, they don't care what you're working on. They need you to have good general knowledge. Right. Okay? Right. So yeah. we're going with on this one. Sounds like we're going to go with B. Best answer, B. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. Uh, please like and subscribe if you want to see more of this content. Yeah, and keep an eye out for uh, volume two coming out uh, shortly. And let us know in the comments what else you want to see.